For today's legal panel, I would like to introduce our moderator, Barbara Karakabi. Barbara has been a reporter at the Houston Chronicle for the past 25 years, and for the past year she's been writing for the religion section and recently did a project for the paper explaining the difference and similarities between Sunni and Shia Islam. Thank you. Hi, I'd like to welcome you all and our eminent panel. I believe our first speaker will be Dr. Donnelly Bowen, correct? Professor of Political Science at Brigham University, and you're going to be talking about re the reform of women's status in Morocco, correct? Do you need a... Okay. Good morning, it's a great delight to be here. And it's a special delight to be in the company of such eminent scholars. I'm very happy to be here to talk about some of the programs that are going on in Morocco right now. I, um, Morocco is very much concerned with reform. For, first of all, to better the lives of their citizens, both economically, socially, and politically. And also, they have a very real interest in combating terrorism. Although they're located on the western edge of the Middle East, North Africa region, Morocco has suffered blows of terrorist suicide bombings. So both in reaction to grassroots move movements and leadership from political elites, including King Mohammed VI and the parliament, the country is engaged in a number of experiments to try to reform areas of women's status amongst a number of other reforms and women's reform is seen as key. Morocco in 2006 showed a great deal of improvement from even 30 years before. When I first went to Morocco to do dissertation research, the infant mortality rate was around 120 per thousand, and in some parts of the kingdom, infant mortality was one in five children. And in some areas out in the mountains, one in two children would survive. Things are going much better. The population has burgeoned to 31, almost 32 million. Um, the number of children being born to uh, one given woman on average has declined from almost seven children to 2.5. A lot of things are going on, but as we've seen, there are still some strong concerns. The, the, the largest concern when, when one speaks to people across the board is the well-being of the family. And this is defined in a, number of different, in a number of different ways, from a macro level down to a micro level. Will my children be able to go to school? Will they be able to have jobs? Will they be able to marry? Will they be able to find apartments? What about my grandchildren? But feeding into these questions of family well-being are a number of other issues. First of all, literacy. And as we'll see in a moment, literacy has been quite an intractable issue. Employment is a difficult question, although the Moroccan economy has lately boomed. Uh, the gross domestic product growth over the last year was over 8%, and unemployment, which has been a very, very severe problem, has come down from well over 20% to down around 10%. AIDS is a question that people are looking at more and more, and it fits into their concern about public health. Now, one of the great um, boons to the country has been the implementation of new personal status law. And I would like to talk about that and how that redefines the family. But one question that I came up with again and again was, is this really being implemented? Are the judges being trained? Are the experts that put this in place taking the, the steps that need to be taken? And then finally, questions of social protection. Are there social safety nets for people who fall through holes in the system? Literacy remains a problem. Only 49% of all adults are literate. There is a strong gender gap. Literate men still outnumber literate women. And literacy is found in urban areas and among the, the young. If we look at older women and if we look at rural women, 
Literacy still is a very large problem. So one of the questions that the Moroccans have to look at is if we implement new programs at the top, how do we get the problems down to every single level? How do we make sure that every family is touched by this? And the two programs that I'd like to talk about with you today are, first of all, the new personal status law, which was conceived and implemented in 2003, 2004. Personal status law takes up questions of family well-being. And Morocco has essentially pioneered a third path in between secularism and in between staying with very traditional readings. The second new program that the Moroccans are attempting and that they're, they're extremely excited about is to integrate women into councils of religious authority both at the very highest levels in the country and all the way down to individual mosques in local areas of cities and rural areas. The personal status law that was reformed, and in Morocco they call it the Mudawana, takes up some of the most difficult questions of family relations that we find anywhere. Um, we know from our own experience in the United States that reform of divorce law has been an, a particularly thorny area. Uh, in the code that the Moroccans have set out, they have worked diligently to redefine family as the personal responsibility of both the husband and the wife. And they have made the wife financially responsible for the family when she is employed or when she is a position in a position because of inherited wealth to also contribute to the family well-being. That said, with these new obligations, the woman gains certain new rights. Okay? Once she is 18 years old, she needs no guardian to make decisions for her or to sanction her marriage. 18 is both the minimum age for marriage for both men and women, although there are exceptions that can be worked through with judges. Okay. In cases of child custody, the woman retains custody of the child, and at the age of 15, both boys and girls choose their, their supervising parent. Strict conditions have been set on polygamy. And polygamy is not much of an issue in Morocco. They estimate that perhaps 2% of the population uh, engages in polygamy, but it is now very, very difficult for a, a woman to become a second wife without being well notified and when, without conditions for the first wife and the first family being set out. And then finally, we have an expansion of a right to divorce for the women. And essentially what the Moroccans have done has been to adjudicate all divorces. No matter who sets out to initiate a divorce, it must go before a judge. And this ends up giving the women far, far more control than they have had before. And during the question period, I'm very happy to talk about any of these issues at greater length. The largest condition for any of the reforms that were made in Morocco is that they must all be made within the context of the Quran and the sources of Islamic law. That said, the Moroccans were careful to delineate areas where change could be made and where change could not be made. The young king, Mohammed VI, states in the preamble to the new personal status law, I cannot, as commander of the faithful, permit what God has forbidden and forbid what God has permitted. But what they have determined that they can do is to put fences around the laws and to bind, to set boundaries that make certain practices more difficult and ease up on other practices. The family is considered the responsibility of both the husband and the wife. The new statute locates the family under the dual responsibility of both parents. Rather than being only the responsibility of the husband because of financial means, 
and granting decision-making to the husband. Okay? Wives now have a very different place. Traditionally, wives were not expected to contribute financially. Any wealth they inherited, any wealth they produced was held by them alone. And they, although they usually did use it, to benefit their family. They had no obligation to use it for support. Okay. Now, the law stipulates in two different provisions that the wife contributes, if able, to the household expenses. And this has set up a redivision of labor and authority that the Moroccans believe will be very beneficial. But as with all things, we have to see how it plays out. The second reform that I'd like to discuss with you is the question of um, how, who speaks for Islam and whether women are represented in terms of religious authority and in terms of communication of religious values. Morocco is an extremely devout country. And the king of Morocco is the highest religious authority as the prince of the believers. Organized under the king is a ministry of religious affairs. And on the other side, the, the learned, the highly expert religious leaders of the country, and also the leaders within towns, cities, mosques, and even er local areas, both urban and rural. At the national level, they have organized a Supreme Council of Ulama. And below that, 30 regional count councils were set up in 2004. And extending from this are 68 different branch councils. The major innovation has been to include large numbers of people not generally included as religious leaders, religious scholars in each council. Psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors, businessmen, all kinds of different um, walks of life have been brought into the council to supplement the traditionally academically trained religious leaders. And each council has included at least one woman member, and the women believe that they will probably expand to more. Regional councils in the largest cities bring in more women. And this has, th this has been so eagerly welcomed by men and women. I, I spent the last two and a half weeks or so in Morocco, and the excitement that that colleagues and that council members and that people in this religious establishment conveyed to me, I think is going to come through in my voice because they're, they're truly thrilled about what's going on in terms of the personal status law and in terms of the regional councils. Now, one of the most important parts of this has been an expansion of the areas that religion is considered to serve. And th this is taking place by both integrating more women into the system and by training women and men to advance what are seen as national imperatives. The first cohort, the first class of both men and women trained by the government graduated in 2006. They began with 160 young men, 60 young women, all of whom have bachelor's degrees in various areas. The majority were trained in Islamic studies or in humanities, but there are many that come in from law, social science, um, physical science, chemistry, physics, from a number of different areas. And both men and women were trained together in a large, large uh, lecture hall to bring them up to a level to communicate advanced training in Islam and Islam's take on social issues to serve in their communities. Before accepted into the program, they, they passed not just written exams, but they passed oral exams. They were all interviewed to see which ones were, were suited to this type of work and were open to, to new ideas. 
I, I must say that the, the training of the women has gotten a lot of international press, but in many ways it's the training of the men that is really, really uh, applicable to the needs of the kingdom. The classes included traditional areas of Islamic studies, and there, there was only one difference between the men and the women that I have seen, which was the men had to memorize the entire Quran, the women memorized one half of the Quran. But they're trained in Islamic thought, history, geography, communication methods, psychology, sociology, the history of religions, data on world religions, contemporary issues, and management. And they, one of the pieces that they were taught were excerpts from Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, and then the criticism of that by Francis Fukuyama. The women religious guides, who we've heard quite a bit about in the press and whom Isabel Coleman uh, mentioned, have work that extends on the local level, just as the imams of the mosques' work extends on the local level. And they are set up to give lessons in mosques, they work in prisons, hospitals, and refuges. They advise on issues related to religion. They visit mosques throughout the area. One, one woman told me that she has 46 mosques that she visits in one way or another. One major mosque, two other main mosques, and then works as far as she can. They work with issues of hygiene, women's worship, and discuss issues of social and medical concern. And AIDS is one of their major concerns at the moment. The, one of the Morshidats mentioned to me, she said, we have so many social problems. She said, we have family problems, we have political problems, we have economic problems. She said, there is no problem that I see that cannot be addressed by faith. And she said, doing this work is my dream. She said, I see when I work with people one-on-one -on -one that I bring them a kind of medicine, a different kind of medicine, one that's desperately needed here. So as Morocco attempts to take on questions of environment, questions of health concerns and STDs, they are utilizing new methods, among which are the places and in the integration of women into their programs. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, speaker is um, <clears throat> Dr. Ruth Halberon Kadari, who will be talking about, um, and you're from uh, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Law, Bar Ilan University, correct? And you'll be talking about religion, religion's impact on women's rights in Israel and in other Middle Eastern countries. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank um, the organizers and the planners of this um, event. I'm grateful for you um, for inviting me over to speak to address um, this audience. And uh, I'd like to express um, thanks for um, Mrs. Kelly Day for her vision generosity. Um, I want to open uh, my uh, 15 minutes uh, with uh, some personal, um, um, maybe confession, uh, not really confession, but uh, I think it is important to um, know um, exactly where the speaker comes from. If there's anything that we learned from um, feminist jurisprudence and feminist um, uh, thought in the last few decades is that um, there is no such thing as a academic uh, objectivity or detachment of uh, a scholar from her uh, field of uh, work, and I think it is especially true uh, in, in, my, in my own case. Uh, so where I come from, not just physically, uh, I come from Israel, and I uh, teach uh, family law in Israel. I write about family law. Uh, I've been doing this for the past uh, more than 15 years now. Um, and uh, I have recently been appointed to the um, United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which um, uh, enables me to gain uh, a lot of uh, international comparative uh, perspectives, which have been both enlightening but also uh, depressing. And uh, I believe you will understand where this um, 
what this depression stands for. But where I come from, as I said, is not just uh, physically and professionally, but also personally. Um, I, uh, I, I, am, uh, I come from an observant family. I conduct uh, my way of life as an observant uh, Jew. And uh, my uh, work in this particular area as, uh, as a family uh, law uh, legal scholar um, involves my own personal struggle within my tradition. And uh, in a sense, uh, I uh, live a kind of uh, uh, split life trying uh, constantly to converge both my uh, feminism with my religiosity, uh, both my uh, liberal um, way of thinking with uh, my um, traditional upbringing, um, which, as I said, is a constant split, it, but it makes, my, it makes life very, very interesting and challenging, but at some points it can also be um, depressing, as I, as I said before. Um, so this is the unique perspective, I believe, where, which I bring to this uh, particular conference. Uh, now, just um, 30 seconds on the title, uh, which you saw in the first slide. The title was, Is Religion Bad for Women? Now, this is borrowed from um, a famous work by uh, Professor uh, Susan uh, Okin, Is Multiculturalism Bad for Women? And her answer is, uh, yes, it is bad for women. And I'm afraid that, uh, in a way, uh, my answer is also yes. But it is not religion as such. It is religion as it is practiced and exercised uh, and conveyed by um, the people who currently um, control and have been controlling uh, religion over our lives uh, and still are controlling religion, uh, the way religion is implemented um, uh, within, particularly in my own uh, country, and I believe also in my neighboring countries, um, unfortunately, and it is very painful for me to admit, as I said before, as an observant person, as a believer, um, it is bad for women. Um, I will um, give a very um, superficial um, analysis of religion's role in Middle Eastern countries and its impact on women. Uh, some of the things will be stating the obvious and I will not want to spend too much time on that. Then I will speak a little bit about the special role of family law in the region and I will focus on Israel as a test case. Now, um, again, I do not presume to speak for my uh, Muslim sisters in the, in the region. I can only speak for myself, as I said, as an Israeli, as a Jew, um, as an expert in this particular area, but uh, it is striking to see the uh, similarities and the commonalities which I really believe that they overcome uh, the differences, whether they are um, geographical, cultural, traditional, or political differences, differences of all kinds. Um, so, religion in Middle Eastern countries. Religion is and has been a definitive factor in most Middle Eastern countries. Um, it is, um, it has been there before the state and it will be there after the state. Religious affiliation is in a way a prerequisite for citizenship in most Middle Eastern countries. You first have to belong to religion. You have to enter to religion. You are born to religion and this entitles you to citizenship in most uh, Middle Eastern countries. And religions in this region have all one thing in common, which is not surprising, which is patriarchy. Patriarchy is defined as male authority, the privileging of male and elder rights, patrilineality, 
different in Israel. In Israel, it is not patrilineality, which is very interesting, but we, will, we cannot spend time talking uh, on that. But uh, patriarchy is a com common denominator of all religions uh, in, that, in that region of, um, of the world. And most Middle Eastern countries either defer family law directly to the different legally recognized religious groups, uh, which is the case in Israel, for example, or uh, in Lebanon. Each person is being uh, uh, under his or her own religious law. You, no matter if you are an atheist, you are born or you belong to a religion, and this religion controls your um, most private sphere of life, there is no option of civil marriage and divorces in most Middle Eastern countries, not all of them, but most of them. And in some countries, the state has, in fact, incorporated the religious family law into uh, its own civil, uh, civil code. The family in Middle Eastern countries, um, most Middle Eastern countries are extremely familial uh, societies or communities. The family and not the individual is the basic unit around which the society is organized and it is the basic subject of the state's concern, which is a completely different way of thinking from the Western liberal political thought. It is not the individual, it is the nucleus or the extended family, which is the basic unit and the uh, concern of, of the state and of the political uh, thought. And the family and kinship, extended family, is the locus of patriarchy. And I want to uh, spend a little more time on, on that. I think that we should not be afraid to uh, confront the reality um, I think uh, um, in her opening remarks um, 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 this morning, uh, we heard that uh, indeed um, there are some um, differences in the way that families are regulated and family law is regulated in Middle Eastern countries. Uh, under Sharia and under Jewish uh, religious law, under the Halakha, um, the family is a patriarchal um, uh, establishment. The uh, husband has the complete control over uh, the property, uh, in some measures over the wife, over the wife's behavior, over the, uh, the children. Uh, the concept is that of separate spheres of men and women. Um, men and women are regarded as essentially different, not as essentially similar or equal. Uh, their roles are separate and different. The roles are complementary roles, not equal roles, of course not identical roles. And we have to face this uh, reality if we really want to try and change, the, um, change it and change uh, um, the situation of, of, of women. Um, now, the necessity of religion's control of family law is, is very clear. If the family is the central and organizational unit of society, and if religion is the uh, essential, uh, definitive um, um, arrangement of, of society, then the two have to converge. The religion has to be in control of family law in order to preserve the uh, authenticity and the identity of the community and the society. And that also explained the necessity of the religious autonomy over the area of family relations and family law, whether it is in order to preserve the community within the state or whether it is in order to preserve the nature of that particular state and country in relation to the, to the external uh, world. And that explains what we saw in the previous slide, the relegation by the state of the legal regulation of family law to the religious rule. And the outcome is that the family law, in fact, becomes part of the sacred. The family and family law have been sanctified. Consequently, they are absolute, unchanging, and immutable. And this is what we have to overcome. Now, Israel, as 
can be taken as a test case of the most extreme form of discrimination um, against, against women. And the heart of the matter lies in the issue of the ending of the marriage. The man, in fact, has complete control over the issue of divorce, over the get, which is the Jewish bill of divorce. There is no option of um, divorce by decree, by judicial decree. The divorce is, in a way, um, the private act of both parties, but in fact it is the act of the man who issues the bill of divorce and gives it to the woman. And without the free will of the man, of the husband, the divorce is not valid. And if the divorce is not valid, then any relations that the woman may have with another man are considered to be the gravest sin under the uh, law of the, of the Torah, of the Old Testament. And any children which may result of that illicit union are termed as bastards, as mamzerim, which are or who are precluded from ever marrying within the Jewish society. These extremely harsh consequences are asymmetrical. They are only on the woman's uh, extramarital relations. If a married man has relation with another woman, as long as that woman is not married to a different man. So if he has relations with a different, with another woman, uh, they are perfectly legitimate and okay, and no consequences would result on those future children from that relationship. Uh, moreover, the secular law in Israel has in fact enhanced the husband's complete control in declaring that the remedy of property of distribution of marital property will only take place after the divorce has been issued or at the death of either parties. That means that whoever controls the divorce, which is the man, also controls the distribution of property. And men obviously have a greater incentive to withhold the distribution of uh, property because they are usually in control of the property. The result is circumstances which are extremely prone to the abuse of power and extortion, and it is a daily routine in rabbinical courts in Israel where the rabbinical judges who obviously, as we heard before, are all male, may turn to the woman and ask her, what are you willing to give in order to get your bill of divorce? How much are you willing to pay? And this may actually uh, uh, consist of, of downright payment or giving up legal rights which she are entitled to under uh, the law, legal guarantees that, may, that maybe the civil system also gives her. Um, let me just go on quickly because I see the, 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 red, the red light. So it is, in my analysis, sorry, in my analysis, it is a problem of dual control. First, we have the control of religion, religious law over marriage and divorce. And this is the control given to the religion by the state. Then we have the male control, the husband's control over the wife's freedom and her right to exit. And we know that under uh, Western liberal political thought, the right of exit is the prerequisite of, of justice. If there is no right to exit, no justice can, can take place. And the husband's control is the result of the religious law. So what can be done? What can be done? Um, I used to think and I used to write extensively trying to change from within. I used to say that it is a problem of dual control, then the solution has to be double-tiered solution, both from within and from without. The external, the actual system has to change. There have to be an option of civil marriage and divorce. The control of the religion has to uh, uh, be ended. Uh, the right to exit have to be uh, have to be there. Has to be there. Uh, but we also must work from within to change the laws from within. People like us, people like myself, uh, just as we heard in um, uh, Dr. Coleman's presentation, I believe, learned women under Sharia law are working to show that religious Sharia law has solutions, just like we under Jewish law are working to show that Jewish law also 
also has solutions, and it doesn't have to be the way it is administered currently under rabbinical, under formal rabbinical courts. But, and I do not have time to explain, uh, I am at this point in my work, I am afraid I am very pessimistic. Uh, the Israeli experience thus far shows that the attempt to change from within is not really working. Maybe failure is too strong a term, but it is not working. There are many political reasons for that under current uh, Israeli political system. Um, but as long as religion has full control, there is no incentive for religion and for those who administer the religious law to change from within. So there must be the external pressure from outside and the external pressure from outside, and this is my final slide, um, really has to come from us, from women, from women in the Middle East, maybe aided by women, by our sisters uh, in the uh, other parts of the world, um, but it must come from us, and um, sisterhood is global, at least it has to be regional, and uh, we all have to unite in order to ch try and change it from within. Thank you very much for your insightful comments. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Dr. Francis Hasso, Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies and Sociology at Oberlin College. She will be talking to us about governmentality and law in the United Arab Emirates and Egypt. Can't, I'm going to stay here. Okay, this is good. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Elora Shahabuddin for inviting me. And also, I appreciate the support of the Baker Institute staff and um, Ms. Kelly Day for supporting this project. And also, I'd like to say I'm very happy to be here with so many colleagues in the field of MENA gender studies, which is quite robust, the field. And I'm going to stick close to my paper so I can stay uh, in, uh, within my time limits, hopefully. And that light is right there. Did, you, did it start already, the light? Yes. So that's, it's green. that's not fair. <laughs> so, okay. Um, this paper emerges from a comparative research project, and the larger project is titled uh, Economies of Desire, not boring old governmentality and law. Uh, and the driving puzzle of this project is to explain the rise of Orfi and Misyar contracted marriages among Sunni Muslims in Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. As I will discuss in a bit, these relationships differ in some fundamental ways from traditional marriage contracts. Arfi Misyar and other such contracts are lay innovations by Arab Sunni Muslims that are produced on college and university campuses, at workplaces, and in backstreet mosques. The practitioners include widows, wealthy or middle class married men, older wealthy women, professional women, men and women of the popular classes, high school and university students, and even some gay men. These relationships are made possible by lay Muslim recognition that the rules of modern MENA states regarding marriage are secular requirements that do not impact whether a marriage is licit in Islamic terms. These relationships, I realized, could not be addressed outside a perceived crisis of the family. Nationals illustrate such a crisis by pointing to phenomena such as high rates of female singlehood, the highest in the world among indigenous women in the Arabian Gulf countries, a rising average age of first marriage for men and women in situations where assuaging heterosexual desire is prohibited as fornication if undertaken outside of marriage, and annual increases in divorce rates in both countries. Families are felt to be difficult to make and even more difficult to keep from disintegrating. A dominant narrative is that globalization, or awlame, has led to the rise of supposed foreign values of looser sexuality norms, lighthearted marriage commitments, alienation within the family, lax commitment to parental obligations and responsibilities, and consumerism. 
These are seen as threatening to collapse the less powerful culture's sexual and marital values. These sexual and marital practices exist at the margins or completely outside the boundaries of what hegemonic institutions are comfortable with, presumably posing a threat to what Michel Foucault called governmentality. For the purposes of today's talk, I work with this idea of governmentality to make a few points, and maybe you'll see them throughout the talk. First, governmentality, which to a significant degree requires the management of marital, sexual, and reproductive regimes, is being challenged by a variety of factors, not all of them bounded by states. Second, it is difficult to draw clear distinctions between the formal institutions of the state and the arena that many call civil society with respect to these issues in the UAE and Egypt, per the arguments made by theorists of governmentality. Third, it is even more problematic to differentiate resistance from social reproduction with respect to how subjects of governments, governance respond to or challenge the hegemonic. And fourth, grassroots innovations and challenges to hegemonic marital and sexual regimes in the UAE and Egypt have ironically provided a rationale for the expansion of discipline and governance, reinforcing each state. I have a long paper, but I'm not giving it. Michelle, let me talk a little about governmentality and hold your, it won't be long that I'll talk about theory, but it is a very interesting idea. Michel Foucault's essay, Governmentality, defines it as a complex form of power applied by Western states beginning from about the middle of the 18th century. The art of government method that provided the foundation for governmentality aimed to, in Foucault's words, establish continuity rather than distinguish between the head of state and the individuals who are governed, so that, in Foucault's words, in a well-run state, individuals will behave as they should. Such state management should allow rule of the, quote, beehive without needing a sting, unquote, with all willing to, quote, obey the laws, accomplish the tasks expected of them, practice the trade to which they are assigned, and respect the established order, unquote. The discursive and practical power of governmentality lies in its productive rather than destructive methods and ends. Governmentality is concerned with, in Foucault's words, the welfare of the population, the improvement of its condition, the increase in its wealth, its longevity, its health. It is the population itself that the government will act either directly on through large-scale campaigns or indirectly through techniques that will make possible, without the full awareness of the people, the stimulation of birth rates, the directing of the flow of population into certain regions or certain activities." Unquote. While governmentality has, as the term implies, much to do with states, its operations occur internal and external to the state, since it is the tactics of government that make possible what is the realm of the state and what is outside of the realm of the state. And that's why theorists of governmentality are very leery of the division between civil society and the state. The goal is for people to be oriented towards self-discipline, self-regulation, and self-management, rather than requiring laws to behave as they should. Foucault argued that this governance orientation was a break with previous political rationality, since its aim was not to reinforce the power of the prince, but rather to reinforce the state even as it coexisted with traditional sovereignty. In the contemporary United Arab Emirates in Egypt, like much of MENA, the techniques and operations of governmentality are largely put to the service of maintaining the power of the prince in the Machiavellian sense, and often very literal Machiavellian sense, 
Thus, surveillance, policing in the negative sense, decrees, and the penal powers of the state are disproportionately important to the maintenance and reproduction of an orderly state. This does not preclude, and this is the irony, indeed it seems to require state-produced discourses of well-being and social welfare. In this sense, it may be that scholars of the state need to better elaborate different classes of governmentality, possibly based on the degree to which the power of the prince and state violence targeted at perceived enemies within remain crucial aspects of governance. In Egypt, a discourse of well-being and social welfare is embedded in the trappings of socialism, republicanism, and constitutionalism, even though the state can also be categorized as authoritarian in its methods of rule. In the UAE, where there is genuine, even paternal concern by state elites for the small proportion of the population considered to be nationals, there is a sh shared understanding that Emiratis live in a state whose rulers grant few political rights, but are fully invested in increasing the national wealth and distributing it. There is little interest among most nationals in undermining the political rationality of the system. In the 20th century, the government, governmentalizing urges of most post-colonial MENA states, driven by the purpose of disempowering traditional sources of authority, led them to establish personal status or family laws, which have already been discussed a number of times today. These new laws rationalized marital, guardianship, and divorce rules through selective codification of Islamic juridical tenets, and that's why you know, it's, you can't really call them sharia law and you need to, it, I mean, we need to be careful about using that kind of language. So they're selectively codified. In many cases, this decreased previous flexibility and negotiability that had allowed women and men to choose among different juridical schools in making and breaking contracts. And Amira Sunbul, I think, is in the audience and she's done some great historical research on this. All five major juridical guilds in Sunni and Shi'i Islam privileged men within marriage and in divorce and child custody rules. As was the case in the traditional religious guilds, the personal status codes expected men to provision wives with housing, maintenance, and child support during the marriage. In return, a wife was expected to be obedient to her husband within limits, as well as be sexually available to him exclusively, which is basically what most marital contracts in most societies uh, look like. Well, the wife expected, well, sexually available to him exclusively, that part. Most states, though, also codified men's unilateral right to divorce without judicial intervention, as well as the Muslim system of separate matrimonial regimes, whereby a woman keeps the property she brought into and earned during a marriage, and a man does the same in case of divorce. Thus, the notion of communal property is largely absent in the abstract. That's why it's important, the theory from the practices. In addition to codifying such rules, post-colonial MENA states formalized a new layer of inequality. Women citizens who married non-national men could not pass on citizenship to their children without special dispensation by the state, whereas men citizens were not limited in this regard. Both Urfi and Misyar contracts violate many of the basic premises of traditional Sunni marriage, although they have produced conflicting non-binding rulings from Muslim religious scholars. The marriages share several characteristics. First, they are usually unpublicized by the couple, violating the historically indisputable requirement to announce marriage, at least to some family and friends, which is why they are frequently referred to as secret marriages. In Orfi and Misyar, the publicity requirement is often translated from the very public wedding to, as one Emirati man told me, quote, having the girl tell seven to eight of her trusted friends and having the guy tell seven to eight of his trusted friends, unquote. Second, these contracts are often transient but Sunni Islam does not allow for intentionally uh, time-delimited marriage. 
Third, both do not require men to provide women with housing and economic maintenance, nor do they require increasingly expensive gifts of jewelry, furniture, and housing, and clothing, um, thus avoiding what are relatively large costs at the beginning of marriage, especially for grooms. In misyar marriages, in fact, the wife may even live with her parents and is regularly visited by the husband. Misyar me, it's from walking. Um, there are also differences, though, between these contracts. First, Urfi marriages avoid the requirement in most guilds of Islamic law for permission from a girl or woman's male guardian for her to marry a particular man, which appears to be the most important explanation why some UAE women choose Urfi, hoping their parents will acquiesce to a fait accompli. Egyptian law, based on selective codification of the, of the Hanafi guild, does not require marital permission from male guardians unless the child is a minor. Second, Urfi partners evade marriage registration with state-sponsored institutions, and the written contract often remains with the husband. It is important to note, though, that paper registration with state or religious institutions was not historically required for Muslims, and lack of registration did not affect and does not affect the validity of marriage. Registration has been part of the way post-colonial MENA states have extended their control over populations. So it's still common in most MENA states for Muslims to marry with the knowledge of their family and friends, but without informing state institutions. And yeah, there's research on this even in places like Tunisia and Syria. Third, in, so I'm still talking about the differences. In contrast to Urfi, misyar contracts, which are on the same standard forms as regular marriages, are usually on file with state courts in the UAE, although the first wives are often unaware of the polygamous relationship. While the forms are the same, these contracts typically include information in which the wife concedes her right to housing, maintenance, and in rare cases, bearing a child. And I will stop, um, and we can talk more during the discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, we're next going to be hearing from Ms. Rasha Al uh, Said from Baker and Botts. And you're going to talk about women in the legal sector. I, I think you have an interesting personal story to tell, too, don't you? Yes. Are you coming up here or sitting? No, there? I'm going to sit here. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Rasha Al Said, and I am a trainee lawyer in the Dubai office of Baker Botts. I am honored to be here and to have this opportunity to address this distinguished audience. I will begin with what I think that we live in a world where power has traditionally rested in the hands of men. This is no more, more obvious than in the Middle East. The achievement of women have often been ignored and the contribution of women often been taken for granted. Middle Eastern women have fought against these odds to prove that they can make a difference in this world and accept responsibilities of important roles in the business world, including in law. Today, we have several shining examples of women who are leaders in their fields and who through their achievement, leadership, and vision have earned the respect of the global business community. I mention in particular, Her Highness Sheikh Lubna Al Qasimi, Minister of Economy of the UAE. Dr. Masuma Mubarak, Minister of Planning and Member of Parliament in Kuwait. Her Highness Sheikh Moza bin Nasser Al Misnad, Head of Qatar Foundation. My own story began in a small neighborhood in Kuwait called Al Omaria. My family moved to Sweden after the Gulf War in 1991 when I was 11 years old. I grew up in Sweden as a normal teenage girl. When I finished high school, I decided to study law because I had always had a passion for both law and justice. I started my law studies at Uppsala in Sweden, but after one and a half year, I decided to move to the Middle East to continue my studies. First, I visited Dubai to look into different universities and to see if I could live in what what to having only known life in Sweden, a very different culture. I convinced myself that it would be easy and, and I would make it. 
I started to prepare, to prepare my documents as soon as I returned to Sweden. It took six months to get the necessary approval to study law at the University of Sharjah and to, and to obtain necessary loan for my studies. Once I had the approval, I packed my bag and started my journey to Dubai. My first real surprise was when I arrived at Sharjah University and they informed me that the course was full and there were no places for more students that term. I asked for approval to commence the course from the headmaster which I was given. Problem solved. Unfortunately, at that point, the officials at the law department informed me that the law studies course was in Arabic only. As I didn't speak Arabic at that time, this was going to be a bit of a problem. I convinced myself that I would learn Arabic during my studies. The headmaster believed in me and helped me to choose less complicated majors for the first course. I went to a bookshop and bought a lot of dictionaries and a big variety colored children posters showing the Arabic alphabet. And I hung them everywhere in my hotel room. I thought that all my problems were solved, but I was mistaken. That was going to be that was only the beginning of the story. I started to look for a cheap apartment in Sharjah, but I found out that not all places rent out to single women. Finally, I found a place, moved in, and was ready to start my studies. My four years of studies for my law degree were not easy. I was forced to write my book several times to, to, from, to memorize it for the exam, but I made it to the end. During my last course in law school, I started to search for a job because I heard that usually it takes a year to find the proper job. During the time I was searching, I found out that I could not be an advocate, a lawyer who can appear in court on behalf of clients, because I'm not UAE national. Only UAE nationals are allowed to take the bar exam and to get the license to appear in court. I felt at that moment that every time I overcome a problem and gather my strength and stand up, a new problem comes and forces me to collapse again. This time, I felt that my dream was being taken from me and I cannot do anything to save it. After a week, a week of glum and depression, I convinced myself that maybe commercial law would be interesting. I decided I will and can be very successful in it. So there I was, graduated, full of hopes and dreams, and looking for a position in a law firm. I went for so many interviews. Some of the lawyers told me that they are not interested in someone who had no experience. Some of them recommended other law firms, and another, who was less than gentlemanly, offered me a job and trainee in exchange of being his girlfriend. I eventually worked as a receptionist for three weeks and HR for a month before I started working as a paralegal for Baker Butts. I have learned a lot in my time with Baker Butts and I have worked hard. Our partner in charge has now created a new position in the law firm titled Trainee Lawyer. And I'm grateful to be able to say that I am the first trainee lawyer in the Dubai office of Baker Butts. In the end, I wish to thank everybody who has supported me in my way of being a lawyer. Thank you very much, Mr. Stephen Matthew, for giving me the opportunity to start my legal career. Special thanks for my colleagues, secretaries, and office assistants at Baker Butts. I also want to thank everybody who made it difficult for me because they only made me stronger. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, <clears throat> I think it's time for question and answers. Can you hear me? Oh. We, have, uh, we have lunch at noon, so question and answer time has to be fast. If you could identify yourself um, and brief. What's that? OK. Identify yourself, please. Brief questions, too. This is a great panel. I appreciate it a lot. And I have a, actually a question. Um, as you were speaking, it occurred to me that uh, what's to be done, and I'm, going, I'm referring to, to Ruth's uh, question.
question. I think the, the problem comes with the whole idea of family and the connection between family and religion. I think that uh, basically in, in my latest research, what I'm doing is I'm studying the genesis of the, uh, of the family. And we need to differentiate between the idea of family as a'ila and family as usra. And family as a'ila was always there. And as people living together in some combination, whether it's the nuclear or the extended. But the usra uh, becomes the legal, legally defined family with a uh, illegal head. Uh, the legal head uh, being somebody that the law recognizes as having certain powers over children, over property, or over women. And I think this only comes in the modern, it comes only in the modern period. And I just wondered if uh, you want to comment on that. Do you understand the question? Once again, it is fascinating to see the, the similarities between uh, the different uh, religious legal systems. Uh, although it is not identical and uh, there are um, variations from the halachic Jewish law and uh, the various uh, different uh, streams of, of Sharia law, um, but I accept uh, your differentiation between the social reality of family, family life, um, um, marriage, bringing up children together, and the legal recognition, the legal regulation of that uh, uh, institution. And um, one of the things that uh, I have been uh, talking about lately, uh, once again, it is very hard to admit it. As, as an Orthodox person, um, I, uh, I stated openly that uh, I will not want my own daughter to enter the religious marriage. I will not want her to be uh, religiously marriage as we say in Hebrew, Kedat Moshe Israel under the law of Moses and, and, and God, because I will not want her to be potentially captive of her uh, future uh, husband. And as long as uh, those in authority of administering the um, uh, religious law do not offer the solutions to this grave uh, discrimination and do not make use of solutions that are there, but they are not being made use of them. Uh, as long as that takes place, um, we women have to resist and we just have to um, refuse entering these um, uh, discriminatory institutions. It is very hard because it uh, contradicts some, some of us, uh, uh, some of our own uh, beliefs. But, uh, but, but there is a way to, to resolve it, and, uh, and, and this is one way in which we can um, perhaps um, um, make, make, make the change um, possible. Um, can I, can I, I, I was going, Just say, can I speak? Okay. Um, I, I'd never thought about the difference between Aila and Usra. And, and maybe, so Usra is patriarchal nuclear family. Where is Dr. Sunla? And, and so Usra is patriarchal nu nuclear family. But I would say that Aila, if you think about it in a governmentality perspective, Aila is the possibility of an alternative political and economic power. So it so USRA was probably necessary for states to gain control over economic and political power, even though both, you know, as we know, family is inflected in the way post-colonial MENA states are constructed. But I think that's a fascinating distinction. Hi, my name is Hannah Sahli. Uh, first, a clarification in terms of the uh, religion being a prerequisite for citizenship in many countries in the Middle East, actually it's uh, the other way around. Most countries do not require religion uh, as a prerequisite for uh, uh, being in a, a citizen. You know, Lebanon, Palestine, Iraq, Syria, Egypt, you can argue that different religions uh, have different status in the society, but it's certainly not a prerequisite. Uh, the other uh, question is to Dr. Bowen. You have mentioned that the... Um, councils that are being developed in Morocco, uh, you know, they are sort of a, like a push forward in terms of uh, the societal status of women and maybe men. But what about if these councils will have a life of their own and they will increase the grip of religion on society in the long run? 
like we have seen in other countries? Oh, that's a, that's a very interesting question. The, th there's a lot going on in Morocco right now, and th there are a number of different pieces to a religious mosaic, and they're, they're very much divided up. One sees political parties and political groups. One sees um, uh, r religious brotherhoods, Sufi religious brotherhoods. One sees the, d the ministries, one sees the independent groups of ulama. So some of the, the most progressive and interesting have t are, are coming down from on, on high, top down. And the, the ones that are pushing p potentially for more restrictive roles are coming up from the grassroots, but they're also countered by civil society groups. The approach the state is, is gambling on. Is, is strong education and addressing social problems. And uh, this, of course, will be tied in with governmental development. But at the moment, they are very much aware that religion can be a, a divider and that it can push in a, con in a conservative or even reactionary direction. But they're, they're betting that there will be a, a liberal sense. Let, let me give you a sense of, of some of the, the, the response to this. Uh, w mosques are beginning literacy programs. And they're directing the literacy programs at women, and particularly at older women, because this is the, the area that is the most in need. Men are sneaking into the programs. And so as, as the women supervise it, one of the problems that they're having to deal with is whether or not they, they move the men out of the programs or not. And they're saying, no, we'll, we'll just let them stay in until they become a problem. If they become a problem, then we'll move them out. But one of the greatest areas that the women are concerned about, or th that the entire religious establishment is concerned about, is an understanding of religion and ad and of Islam that bypasses so many of the restrictions that have fed in over the centuries of different writings and different problems. And you're very right that this can be interpreted in different ways. But let me give you one fast example. We've got one more question and not, not very much time. <laughs> Do you want to, I'll hold the example, Val, and you go ahead. Okay, thank you, because um, it does pertain to your presentation, um, but it's addressed actually to um, anyone who could answer this particular question, and perhaps Amira might want to address. Um, Donna, with respect to the, um, uh, to the reform of the family law in Morocco, you mentioned that it was framed almost entirely in Quranic and Islamic legal terms. Um, I'm wondering, though, whether the sources um, for the reforms um, uh, are diverse, um, so international laws and norms as well as uh, Quranic um, uh, and Islamic law. And that's because, for example, the idea that women now are legally responsible for the household, financial contributions to the family, um, actually that is not um, part of classical interpretations of Islamic law. Um, that was the case in uh, Moroccan law prior to the reform, but it's not the case today. So it seems to me that that is drawing more on international laws and norms. Um, so I, I wonder if you could comment on that um, and anybody else. Um, in other words, one does need, as, as Ruth was also suggesting, one needs to go outside, in some cases outside of the, um, the religious framework, in order to achieve um, this kind of um, uh, dignity and, and equality. Thank you. The, the answer that, that some of the professors gave was that this was not a liberalization, that their, their basic sources of law pertained to the Quran and the Hadith writings. And they said, what we are utilizing is ishtihad, which is a process of reasoning based on precedent and based on religious sources. And reasoning from the basic the statements in the Quran that set up men as equal to women and adapting it to current days. Okay, that we have a situation today and how do we set this up? This is what they have arrived at. Now I think as you look at this you can see that there may be possible dangers as there are in any time that one begins to rework law. But this is what they have and, and they're very eager to go forward and see where they go from here. But they, they are adamant that the sources are Quran and Hadith and that the writings of 
intellectuals like myself are of no import whether they were written 400 years ago or 600 years ago, written by men or women. I just want to add here, um, this could have been said about um, Jewish religious um, attempts to um, make changes and to adapt and to develop. Um, there is a very um, famous uh, saying by one of the um, founding mothers of Orthodox feminism, um, Blue Greenberg from the United States, and uh, she coined the phrase saying uh, that when there is a rabbinic will, there is a halachic way. So it really depends on the will of, once again, those who are in authority. And I believe that their will is indeed and can be subject to those external international pressures from uh, outside. And we, we need to keep, to keep pushing in that direction because the religious law is, 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 is much, much broader than what is currently being exercised and, and administered. One of the... One of the, the professors tells the story that one of the imams in training left the classroom as she was speaking. He came back in with a book and he asked permission to read from the book. And as he read the book, the, the scholar said, if you allow women the ability to, to divorce, they will change their husbands as rapidly as they change their clothing. And he shut the book and looked at the professor. And her reply was, that's a fine opinion, but it's the opinion of a man. And what we're looking at in this class is the Quran and the Ahadith. One more question, then lunch. Thank you very much for recognizing me. My name is Shahla Hayri, and I want to make one comment and, um, and one question. Um, the comment about um, the rabbinical uh, will and the change um, by women. I think one thing that women in Iran at least have been able to achieve, you know, in the past uh, 10 years, uh, you know, the feminist movement that is gaining momentum is to split, in fact, the rabbinical will, to split the clerical unity, and they have been very successful at that. Of course, the ulema who are siding with them, who use, who have the ability to use ijtihad, aren't as, you know, a high level, at least officially, as the other ones, but nonetheless, the view is now divided, and many of them are supporting women's rights to divorce or to custody of children, to inheritance, to um, the you know, penal code and what have you. So I think it is important to be able to create that rabbinical will at some point. But the question is to Professor Hasso. Um, I was very interested in the marriages of Messiar and uh, Urfi that you mentioned. You're familiar with mut a marriage yes. and the fact, that it is, <laughs> the fact that it has been legal you know, in Iran for, yes. you know, for all of us. I think it is important to keep that uh, a comparison. So if you would like to comment on that and yes. the differences or similarities if you have time. Yeah, I, I, mean, I don't have a lot of time, but I mean the, the, the major difference and, and uh, Dr. Ha'eri has written also very importantly on marriage in Morocco and Iran, um, is that it's, it's uh, right, it's not, the, the way that it's not the same as muta is that it cannot be intentionally time delimited in advance. Now, in practice, um, it is often, uh, especially, and there are thousands of women who have been left by their husbands, who ha and he's got the paper. So, um, but in, intentionally, it is not supposed to be, and that's essentially the critical difference. And I, and in my field work in the UAE, I, you know, because there are a lot of Shi, uh, Shi'i uh, Muslims in the UAE, I mean, I went to a mosque where uh, uh, you could get uh, muta contracts, and there's just a whole neighborhood in Sharjah where you could um, work it out. Thank you. Can you explain what that contract means? Maybe not everyone knows that. Oh, uh, well, she's probably better than I am, but um, muta or sira uh, contracts are they, they're, uh, uh, consensual contracts between a man and a woman. It's a marriage, um, and it can be from an hour to 99 years. And uh, so it really, and if you look at Professor Ha'eri's book, you'll see that it operates in practice in really a range of ways. Um, it functions in a, in a, to make halal 
uh, various kinds of relationships and possibilities. Uh, there is a payment or a gift, the children are and the children are legitimate, and that's actually crucial. And, and, and there's a, I think there's a two-month adda rather than three or four adda. And, um, yeah, so I think that, and that's actually a critical problem with urfi because if the state citizenship is completely determined by the state, if there's no contracted marriage, then what you have is a lot of um, illegitimate uh, children in the eyes of the state that are not citizens. Thank you very much for a fascinating panel, and now let's go to lunch.